good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Danube Institute um, for the latest um, evening of discussion on current events, politics, literature, and what have you. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you, and um, I'm not. I'm going to say only a very few words about the work of the institute. Um, I will, they are as follows: that we have, we are um, conservative in cultural affairs. We are classical liberal in economics. We are Atlanticist in foreign policy. But we believe in testing all of these convictions of our own uh, against. Uh, those of our, of our opponents, of our democratic, respectable opponents, um, which is why whenever we can, we promote uh, discussions uh, rather than simply lectures and debates um, as, and conferences which are allow a, a range of, um, of opinions to be expressed. Um, we also believe ourselves to, be, to have a mission to um, connect Hungary with the rest of Central Europe, uh, to connect Central Europe uh, with uh, particularly the English-speaking world. Um, the relations between um, Hungary and Central Europe on the one hand and Western Europe on the other are very well covered in Budapest by institutions like the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, we can't hope to compete with them on that, but we, uh, we collaborate with them when we can and, and doing so. And, um, but we have, uh, so to speak, a unique selling proposition, which is our relations with um, England, Australia, um, Canada and the United States, and we hope to promote, uh, we are to act in a way as a kind of transmission belt, a transmission belt of ideas, but also of people between these different parts of the world. So in, in doing so, for instance, um, we, uh, we arranged conferences in, uh, in, on Ukraine in Washington with the Hudson Institute. We invited and um, arranged for Geza Jasensky, the distinguished historian and former foreign minister, to speak at several conferences on Australia. Um, and of course, we brought in uh, distinguished guests from other parts of the world uh, here. Now, I did say we couldn't, in general, hope to compete with uh, institutions like the, uh, the uh, the French and German cultural institutions here, but I will make an exception for this evening uh, because, of course, we have both an important topic but also three extremely distinguishes, distinguished contributors to, to discuss it. The topic is what the devil is going on in France. And, uh, and certainly very important events seem to be taking place in France. I shan't attempt to give my view of them because I would be easily outdistanced in that by our three contributors. But there is no doubt when you look at um, a situation in which there have been riots for now umpteen weeks, it seems to me, or something like 13 or 14 at weekends, and that on top of an already existing situation in, in which um, the cars have been burned quite regularly in, in the banlieues around Paris and, and other major cities. And then thirdly, we have had um, quite dramatic elect election results in France, unexpected in many, in many ways, but also, um, although expected, still dramatic, which is quite unusual to get those, to have that combination. And the combination here is, of course, uh, somebody who, uh, the president and president, who emerged um, I don't say from nowhere, he emerged from the establishment, but he managed to emerge from the establishment and yet present himself as a completely new uh, outsider and presence on the French scene. And again, he created his own party uh, as well as winning presidential election, and his party went on to win a substantial presence in the National Assembly. So uh, he, he did this all in defense or in, to, in order to advance a view of French interests and, uh, and, French, um, um, and French power that is very much a part of uh, European integration. France would achieve great things in promoting European integration uh, because, of course, uh, um, his view, and that I think of most people in the French establishment, is that the, uh, the strength of Europeanism very directly improves and increases the strength of France. So all of these uh, events uh, contradicting each other in a sense because um, the, the fact is that uh, Mr. Macron's attempt to lead Europe down the path of integration is run up against very serious obstacles, including the fact that it looks as though the Germans are not prepared to help finance it. But 
um, at the same time, how can you, how can he um, establish uh, the, the French as the leaders of a European movement at the same time as he's finding it very difficult to get his policies through, or when he gets them through, to make them stick in, in French politics? So there's a very complex and interesting situation. Now, I'm going to introduce our spe three speakers, and, um, and, and, and in turn, I will ask each of them in the, in the, um, to, to talk to us on, well, whatever aspect of the situations in France. I mean, reflections on the revolution in France, it um, may be a bit of an exaggeration as a topic, um, but there are, <laughs> there are elements of truth in it, at least. And um, now, my first, uh, I'm going to call on, uh, the first person I'll call on is Anne Elizabeth Moutet. Um, Anne Elizabeth is an extremely distinguished um, French journalist um, who is also a journalist who is very well known and active and read in the English speaking world. Um, she has been a correspondent for many years now for my own old paper, the Sunday Telegraph, and um, she is a regular contributor to the BBC, uh, the New York Post, and many other. Um, uh, many other journalistic institutions on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, she is a distinguished fellow of the Gatestone Institute. Uh, some years ago, just after, um, just after Nicolas Sarkozy had been elected president, she, I, very, uh, I got a very kind invitation to come and address uh, a breakfast in Paris of the Jean-Jacques Rousseau Society. Uh, I think you're still with that, are you? Yes. Absolutely. Well, um, I want to say that uh, what a great pleasure it is to welcome you to Budapest. I think it's your first visit. Um, so, oh, it's your so, second. Oh, okay. In that case, I'm completely wrong. Um, well, so but <laughs> oh, yes, of course. That's right. You were so at our conference. Uh, I, want, I want to thank you very much for reminding me of that. And I want to... to <laughs> I want to... Um, I want to welcome you here again uh, and to say we look forward very much to what you have to say. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And, and indeed, I came back having been uh, here at the um, um, uh, uh, Danube Institute two years ago uh, when there was um, uh, sort of reflections on 100 years of Russian Revolution, which was a fascinating conference and, and a good reminder of people who look at the past with rosy, not to say red, uh, lenses. And that was a really great conference. Um, and I'm always happy to be in Budapest, which is one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Um, I... Uh, there's a very famous quote, uh, possibly apocryphal, of Louis XVI, uh, um, who was looking outside when the, the people were massed in the courtyard at the Palace of Versailles in 1789, and he said, c'est une révolte, and uh, is this a rebellion? And, and somebody, uh, one of his advisors, possibly Lafayette, but we're not sure, said, non, sire, c'est une révolution. No, sire, this is a revolution. Well, I'm going to say the opposite about what's going on in France right now. It is not a revolution, it is a re it's a rebellion, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, easy to get out of. Um, and to, to understand what happens now, actually, which came as a surprise, certainly the intensity of uh, uh, the uh, uh, protests for the past three and a half months uh, is something that surprised the president, um, but he had had warnings, or his, uh, uh, his government had had warnings, and, and they were not read right. Um, the, there, was, there was more and more, dis there was growing discontent in France, and it's basically something that was long overdue that you've seen somewhere else. You've got, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the expression flyover country in America, people who are being ignored. Uh, flyover country is, you know, when you, when you take a plane from New York to Los Angeles, you fly over the rest of America. These are people who eventually got their voice into the White House with President Trump. You have people in Britain that have voted for Brexit to also the establishment surprise. Uh, you've seen the progress uh, to less surprise because Italy was sort of, uh, had given up on every possible system. Uh, in Italy and the election of the uh, Cinque Stelle and the Lega Nord, uh, um, uh, the Lega now, uh, uh, to government. And people said, oh, but France is immune. We don't have populists in France. We are different. And indeed, the reason why Emmanuel Macron was elected, coming seemingly out of 
nowhere, uh, was precisely because he was not very well known. He'd been a cabinet minister for less than two years. He'd been the deputy chief of staff of the, of the, um, of the Elysee Palace, and he was a blank slate. And people thought, this is a new face. He's younger than anybody else. He, his sudden candidacy is annoying all the well-known faces that we want to get rid of, really. And they thought that he would also be a new broom, which of course he wasn't, because he is the ultimate product of the French uh, um, uh, system that uh, creates an extremely tight-knit elite uh, and, and uh, who's a, a kind of elite that goes into two or three uh, uh, um, schools, one engineering school, one government school, uh, one or two others, uh, um, and, and these people find themselves disproportionately, disproportionately at the head of most everything in the country. Uh, we, in the last 14 prime ministers, uh, two-thirds came out of ENA, the French government school, the top sort of postgraduate government school. Um, half the presidents have come out of ENA. Um, you know, you talk about, the, the British talk about the, the class system fostered by the Oxbridge system, you know, saying you go to these things in America, it would be Ivy League. Uh, there must be colleges in Hungary and that, it, like that, today in, 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 in Japan. But the French system is much, much tighter. Uh, Macron went through the whole system. Uh, he was bright. Uh, he uh, uh, is mostly a Mandarin and a civil servant. He had a, a short period as a merchant banker, but people say, oh, he's a banker, he comes from Rothschild or wherever. Uh, no, he was hired by the bank because the French system is so uh, uh, ensconced in, in, in a state system that whenever you do uh, any kind of international uh, business deal, you need the approbation of the Ministry of Finance, you need the approbation of a number of uh, powers that be. If there's a danger that it might cost jobs to the country, you need that. And therefore, he was a luxury pilot fish. Uh, if you're a foreign, especially if you're a foreign company, which is not the case of Rothschilds, you hire yourself an inarch, uh, the better ranked uh, coming out of the school, you know, the, the better the better it is for you, and they can talk to the government, to the mandarins, with the same voice. They have been to school with these people, and that's that's what uh, Macron was. He's not somebody who will structure a deal with mezzanine and finance. He's somebody who knows people, and. When you go to those schools, uh, you get in uh, through a grueling competitive examination, uh, uh, and perhaps you know five percent of the people who apply actually get to the examination and then get to pass it, and then you uh, you study for two three years depending on the school, and then you come out and you're again you're ranked, and uh, your rank coming out of the school decides. Uh, of your career for the next 40 years. This is like the only thing that you can probably compare this to is the Chinese Mandarin system in the Confucian system. Um, and uh, this, is, this was the, the young man who, being close to power, uh, being himself ambitious and, and, and engaging, decided that he had a future in politics and he could become president. And he became president in 2017 at the age of 39. And because in his march towards the presidency, he encountered and he channeled the discontent of so many people in France that didn't know how to express themselves. They thought, he's annoying so many people. He is basically has destroyed most political parties. He completely destroyed the left. And he came from the left. He had been in, in the, Holland, the Hollande cabinets. And, and he reduced the right to a small, angry rump. Uh, and therefore, they, they, they voted him in. Uh, he had solutions, and his solutions were, were to say, we don't need political parties, we don't really need to talk to the unions, in fact, we don't really need to talk to many people, we have a plan. Europe is part of the plan, but there's not just the, the plan for Europe, there's the, uh, a combination of fairly uh, sort of modest reforms in order to reduce uh, the French state uh, um, uh, uh, colossal uh, expenses and the tax burden and a number of, of voluntarist uh, uh, attempts to, to reorganize French industry in a way that would help it to defend itself, which in itself is not always, uh, uh, cannot always be uh, uh, made to gel with, with um, European law, but that was something that he thought he would, uh, he would take care afterwards. Um, the, he got elected, and people realized that he was exactly like the others, and they remembered uh, then what they had looked at during his campaign, <coughs> such as uh, the, the innate feeling of superiority of somebody who's basically had uh, a good and 
life, not in flyover country, but in the capital. Uh, and all of this came back to haunt him so that the rebellion is something that is both something that was born for a long time out of discontent in France, and at the same time, and the fact that people feel that their children will not have uh, uh, a good life or indeed will not even have a life similar to what they've had and therefore the feeling of insecurity which is common to most Western countries nowadays um, and at the same time the, um, the feeling that they were being insulted by somebody who despised them and I can go on on, on the mistakes he made uh, on, on uh, the being in a sort of lively discussion with somebody during his campaign and uh, 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 workers in a provincial city saying, you know, you come to see us and you, you have your uh, $1,000 suits. And he says, all you need to, to buy a $1,000 suit is to work hard, uh, which is charming, but not, you know, it's not reality for these people. He was, he he speaks good English and he also uses English words in French and he talks about France as being la start-up nation, uh, the start-up nation and all sorts of things in, in, uh, en anglais dans le texte. And that was the sort of feeling that he was only interested in young modern people doing modern things and he was not interested in the rest of the country. Um, the result is that the rebellion is both something that is structural of which uh, the préfet, the French functionaries that sort of oversee what's going on in, in each of the départements that constitute France, were sending reports to Paris for several years saying uh, there is exhaustion uh, of people who feel that the, the uh, uh, social uh, sort of uh, mobility is broken, that they are going down and, and they're very, un and you know, we will see things. And you could see, because you heard about this saying, uh, French farmers burn things and 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 uh, uh, demonstrate and block uh, lorries from other countries carrying produce. This is something that has been happening in France for decades. Um, uh, people refusing to pay uh, a, a green tax on 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 uh, driving on motorways and destroying the um, uh, the electronic equipment that was supposed to to uh, assess uh, the passage of cars and trucks for the um, uh, for tax, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this was. Uh, because the French like to demonstrate and because there has been a toleration for a kind of violence during demonstrations, all of this was supposed to be business as usual. And business as usual came to a head uh, last November when the government decided that there would be uh, two things. One thing that started the rumbles was uh, bringing down the speed limit from 90 kilometers an hour to 80 kilometers an hour to roads that were not a motorway in France country roads. Uh, this looks like nothing at all, and people say, why not? Uh, this is supposed to uh, lower the death toll in car crashes. It's a good thing. But the realization by people who rely on their cars to live because slowly the great French infrastructure ha is, has become moth-eaten because small train lines have been closed down, because uh, uh, the uh, uh, infrastructure that used to exist in France has disappeared, because then if you want to take your children to a hospital, you have to drive 30 miles. If you want to go looking for a job, you have to have a car because otherwise you, you would need to take a bus early in the morning and take one late at night and it would not even deposit you at your home. Uh, all sorts of things that used to be actually some of the best in, Western, in the Western world in France have disappeared and there's a feeling among uh, uh, people that the social contract was broken and there was no understanding that a car was not a luxury, uh, an old banger was not a luxury. It was that, or you could not work, you could not bring up your children, you could not go to a hospital, you could not do the simple things of life. And then this was compounded by a special tax on, 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 on another tax on, on gasoline and, and diesel fuel, and that was supposed to be good for the planet. And it became very obvious very fast that the money was not, uh, uh, actually most of the money was not going to green causes most of the money was going to try and shore up the deficit in the French budget. And the demonstration started, and the Hivers yellow jacket that uh, uh, the demonstrator wore, wore was, first of all, it was very easy. Everybody, by law, is supposed to have one in their car just in case you have an accident and people can see you on the side of the street, of, of the road. Uh, and it was also something that was symbolic, as, you know, we were not seen, but now you're going to have to see us. Uh, now, I'd like to sort of play, well, not the devil, because I don't think Macron is the devil, but uh, I'd like to sort of express one thing that the French are not totally aware of, is that even having said that public services have gone down, uh, if you're French, and 
probably that must be more or less the case in Hungary, uh, you are not bankrupted by illness. We have a good healthcare system. It is less Malthusian than the, uh, the natural health. It's got better outcomes. We have a longer, uh, 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 longer longevity, one of the longest longevities in the West. I think the Japanese live longer. Um, so some of the worries of life are taken out of your hands. Education in France is free. Sometimes for good schools, you get even paid, and then you owe time to the state. Uh, so all of those things that are uh, really decide of the life choices in other countries um, have been made by the nanny state for you and the outcomes are actually rather good. But uh, when you want to pay your bills and that you comes you know, uh, the 15th of the month so you can't pay your bills, uh, it is almost impossible to get across <laughs> the fact that you actually are getting lots of things that you don't realize that are being paid for you. Uh, and and that was, that's something that is very difficult to come across because people say this is normal. Uh, free healthcare is normal, uh, free education is normal, it's civilized, Americans are stupid, etc. Uh, what now we have is we have a movement that started with immense sympathy, sympathy from the population. And what's interesting is the sociology of the movement is not poorest people, it's not unemployed people. And it certainly is not people from the banlieues, the, uh, the projects around the large cities. Um, there's a geographer called um, uh, Christophe Guilloui, a social geographer, who for the past almost decade has been studying uh, um, sociology and geography in France. And he developed a concept that is illuminating when you look at the current situation and he calls it la France périphérique, peripheral France. And that doesn't mean France at the borders, it means those parts of the country that are peripheral to the concerns of the large booming metropolises. So it would be northeast in England, uh, it would be places in the south in Italy. Um, it's, these are people who, unlike uh, uh, the, the, the denizens of the banlieue of the projects, uh, do not break things, do not steal things, do not burn cars, do not do these things that you're talking about, and get no help and no subsidies. We'll keep aside farmers because the farmers have got a powerful lobby and French farmers have defended themselves and there's a combination of actual excellence in, in French farming and uh, historical significance of French agriculture over the last millennium at last, at least. That means that farmers are not entirely unheard. But if you're talking about people who live in small towns of 40,000 people, 50,000 people, uh, and those towns, it's impossible to leave them because if you own your house, you cannot sell it. Uh, there's heavy stamp duty and the value has gone down because nobody wants to live there. If you rent your house, it's cheap, but you cannot go and rent somewhere else where you could get a, get a job because the rents are out of your control and public services are disappearing. And this is what Christophe Guilloui calls la France périphérique. And he's been saying for four books that are becoming angrier and angrier as he writes on and he sees no reaction, uh, that uh, uh, France has now decided to turn its back on, on, on half its population, actually 60% estimated of the French population, uh, who are those who are left behind by globalization and, and uh, uh, a sort of an affluent minority uh, who are not, who are not looking at that. Again, this sounds extremely familiar. Now, the political situation with the, with the yellow jackets in the beginning had all this world sympathy, the sympathy because everybody knows somebody who's striving because we have high structure and employment in France for all sorts of reasons. It's people, it's difficult to hire because it's difficult to fire and once you're in employment, uh, you can stay for a long time, which means that there is no turnover in hires, and therefore, uh, if you're fired from a company, uh, you can go looking for six months, a year, two years, which is not the same as, as, for instance, in England. All of this is a discontent that meant that even people in Paris were feeling, no, I understand, you know, life is not easy, we know that our prices are going up all the time. Um, uh, figures for inflation do not take into account the fact that those things that uh, uh, go down, such as electronics or clothes, are not things that you, can, you need to buy every day, uh, whereas uh, uh, food, which is going up all the time, and essentials and rents and utilities, all of that, and, and gas, all of this is going up every day. Um, and then if you do an index for, for inflation in France, it will not budge, but it will not budge because as long as you buy a plasma screen every week, but otherwise you are hit by inflation. The sympathy has been 
First of all, Macron was struck by this because he thought he had the solution. Reduce the, the expense of the state, make some reforms, tax people some more. And it's, it was a policy mix that was not in itself uh, dishonoring, it was not stupid, but it was difficult to get people to accept it. The first battle he waged, he won. That was the battle with the train system who had special <laughs> extra protections. And the moment had come to say, look, you who have those protections and work for the, the French trains and the French trains are good, we will not touch your advantages, but new people who get hired after you, they will you know, get back to what everybody gets. And that took time, it went well, there was no major strike. Uh, and he thought, okay, I can swing this, I can really reform this country. Uh, and then hubris, you know the Greek notion, uh, sort of you know, was looking at him thinking, oh, you think that? And Nemesis hit him with a club, and uh, he found himself in, in a situation in which suddenly he could do no right, and this is somebody who for, for almost 40 years could do no wrong. So he was so shocked by this, he thought, uh, this is not really important, uh, let's wait it out. And the fact that he, first of all, did not meet with any representatives of the movement for two, three weeks, and then he offered, and by that time, nobody knew who represented the movement. Right at the beginning, this is something in which you have to go into, into crowd psychology. Uh, this is an inchoate movement. What characterizes the movement is discontent. It's a shared feeling, and it's also in a country in which people do not open up to one another the way they would, for instance, in America, a sense of solidarity and a sense of bottom-up fraternity. And that cannot be overstated because that's the reason why it succeeded so much. And some of the best journalists reporting on the movement have spent time on the roundabouts in the middle of you know, the, the road system outside cities in France. Uh, where, people, where the yellow jackets uh, are congregate and sometimes stop traffic or just you know, congregate and talk among themselves. And what was reported was the uh, people who were, felt that they were on their own, that they were not helped, that the French bureaucracy was not unkind but certainly not interested in their personalities or their problems. Uh, they found kindred spirits and, and that created something that morphed into, into a different movement and that morphed into something uh, that still cannot be defined, but that has become harder as they, uh, they felt that nobody was answering what they were saying. So eventually Macron said, we will, you know, realized after three, four weeks of riots in big cities and riots, which increasingly were not by the majority of the yellow jackets, but were by characters on the extreme right and the extreme left that aggregated themselves to the movement and towards the end of demonstrations that started quietly in the morning, in the afternoon started uh, uh, sort of, you know, fighting the police, destroying things, stealing things. Uh, Macron eventually said, no, we will give a package, you will get an extra bonus at Christmas, you will get a hike of 10% of the minimum wage under certain conditions. I mean, and it cost the nation budget 10 billion euros, which honestly it could not very well afford. And this was seen by the movement as too little too late. Uh, at the same time that nobody then uh, uh, was seen as being somebody who, was, uh, who, who had uh, uh, sort of validity uh, to speak with the movement. The, in the end, the leaders that came out of this and who are largely unpleasant, and those who weren't unpleasant were immediately threatened and threatened badly, uh, you know, death threats and so, things like that. Uh, there's a woman called Ingrid Vavasseur who's not stupid and who's decided, she said, I'm going to start a yellow jacket uh, uh, list for the European elections. And she got death threats in the mail, on social media, etc. cetera. Uh, and the people who came out are people with their own agenda, extreme right, extreme left, how are they chosen? Uh, this is the first time, in, I think, in my memory that uh, uh, um, the leaders of a social movement have been appointed by television bookers. Uh, all, you know, 24-hour uh, news channels, cable news channels, needed people to talk. And uh, the minute they saw somebody talking into an iPhone that had personality, they'd say, well, come, you know, we, we need somebody with a yellow jacket uh, on a panel, uh, and, and you will come. And the, the personalities that came out were probably, we can see that they were the worst possible that you needed if you wanted to negotiate, because they were, they were taken out of obscurity precisely because they, they, they were colorful and, and aggressive. So we get now to a point where Macron has not realized that uh, why he would be the problem. His 
New Year's wishes were an example in not how, how not to do things instead of uh, quoting what people had been saying and having a sort of humility in addressing the problem. He um, uh, lectured, there's no other word, he, he started lecturing people and now he said one way out of this is to have the great debate among the nation organized in, in various regions in France and day after day he goes or other politicians go and they gather with citizens <coughs> who want to talk, they gather with mayors, they, uh, they say that you know every 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 feed every piece of feedback, whether in meetings or in writing or on the internet website that's dedicated, is going to be listened to, that which is a great deal of, of material, and that's too much too late, uh, and that is going to sort of come to a new way of reorganizing French society. But by now, the movement is a monster. Uh, it's uh, you know it's got strange uh, uh, sort of. Uh, it wants to sort of reinstate taxes, it wants to tax the rich. Uh, you have to realize that the tax burden in France is the heaviest in, 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 the, Western, in the Western world. Uh, it wants to tax companies, it wants to uh, redistribute, even though uh, France, which is a country with inequalities before tax, is, has fewer inequalities after tax, more, less than Sweden even. So we already redistribute a great deal of, of, of uh, the product of the, the, the tax, um, uh, tax levers. Uh, and all of this means that he sort of locked himself into something where he just hopes now that everybody is going to be exhausted, that the destruction and the fact that it's impossible, it was impossible for uh, uh, shops to sell stuff in the run up to Christmas, it was impossible for shops after Christmas to do sales. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, places, big and small, in big cities that are going to close down because they've lost 40% of their annual turnover, uh, and, and that's, you know, they can't pay their rents. Uh, and there's a feeling of annoyance in the country that slowly, in bitterness, supersedes the feeling of solidarity that almost everybody expressed. This is not a good place to be. This is a very bad place to be. Uh, it's going to leave scars. It, eventually, exhaustion will claim this, but this is when you think, we, uh, Macron's party's specialty was to do away with classical parties, to say we're new, we're 2.0, we're different people, and therefore no political parties, no, uh, you know, no, no uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, bottom-up feedback. Uh, and now you realize that that leaves people without organization. I, I can recall lots of strikes in, in French history because we have a history of doing strikes, but I will quote, and in this place, I'm sorry to be quoting approvingly Maurice Torres, the historic leader of the French Communist Party in the 30s and 40s, and Maurice Torres was allied in the Popular Front when there was a general strike in 1936, and he said very famously, il faut savoir terminer une grève. You must know when to end a strike, because he was a professional of politics, and the idea that all politicians are rotten and that you can create out of thin, you know, thin air a party of 30-year-olds who know absolutely nothing, have no experience, means that when you find yourself with troubles, you have nobody who knows how to wind things down. Again, you know, I, I will then quote uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill to give an example of what's nice about people who have experience of politics for a long time and it will make you happier, and I will wind this down. We are now in a situation which I don't know how to conclude it, but uh, the president doesn't know how to conclude it, the rest of the country doesn't know how to uh, conclude it, and no party, even the extreme left, even the extreme right, uh, is really sort of making hay out of this. And now I'm waiting for our, my foreign friends to tell me what to do with my country. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was a wonderfully comprehensive and at the same time entertaining account of what's happening. Um, and I hope at the end of this uh, session, after the three speeches, we'll know exactly how to solve the problem. <laughs> Um, but let me now turn, if I may, to, uh, to Esther Soos, who is a distinguished um, uh, academic uh, expert on French literature, French language, and uh, more recently, French politics. Um, you're at Alte, and um, I'm just going to say that uh, we've invited you here, and we're hoping you're going to be able to tell us um, the Hungarian attitude to this and what impact this is making on Hungary, because of course it is making an impact everywhere in in Europe at the moment. So, may I invite you to talk to us? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, of course, I'm not going to be uh, able to avoid some sort of a reflection here, uh, because I think that. Uh, 
the phenomena that we see in France now are very logical. Uh, one thing is coming practically from the other. So first of all, I think we have to go back uh, up until the circumstances of the election of Emmanuel Macron. Uh, now, there are some conspiracy theories uh, in circulation when it comes to his election, uh, mostly due to the fact that uh, until February 2017, François Fillon, uh, Republican, was considered to be the next president of France. Uh, at the end of January 2017, his uh, corruption scandals uh, broke out. You all remember these scandals. Uh, let me just say that uh, if Fion were more careful, more conscious of his ambitions, uh, he would not be president of France and Macron would be uh, constituting a movement, building his little uh, sphere of influence and preparing for 2022. Uh, so I think the Fion case is the same as the Dominic Strauss-Kahn case. Even if it's a conspiracy, even if it's a trap, uh, you can only walk into a trap if you walk into that trap. May I, may I say something? Yeah. Well, why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> my, my, my attitude to conspiracy theories is, is that one should never uh, ascribe to conspiracy what can be explained by incompetence. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's called Occam Razor, if I'm not uh, mistaken, so we should always go for the, <coughs> the simplest solution, which is always incompetency. Um, but it's important, because um, Macron is sort of president by accident. Uh, and even if he was elected by roughly 66% of the vote in the second round of the presidential election, uh, we shouldn't interpret this as a huge popular support for Emmanuel Macron. Part of this huge popular support was against the corrupt elite. Of course, there was this populist element of uh, the Macron campaign. And secondly, part of this support was against Marine Le Pen and the National Front. So many of the voters of Emmanuel Macron in the second round of the presidential election were not actually Macron electors, but rather anti-Le Pen electors. Uh, so when we interpret his electoral victory, uh, I think we shouldn't go overboard. We should be conscious of this fact. Uh, there was this Macron hooray when he was elected. Uh, I don't want to hurt the international press, but it was all over the international press. And I think this element was lacking from the interpretations, or mostly lacking from the interpretations when it comes to uh, his victory. Uh, also, the fact that he went against Marine Le Pen is very important. Uh, the uh, peripheral France thesis uh, is very important. I wanted to mention it because uh, it is also a sign of a new political cleavage being formed in France. In politics, by cleavage, we mean a social conflict or a social problem that kind of shapes politics and most importantly, electoral politics. Uh, already in 1992, uh, on occasion of the Maastricht referendum, and on occasion of the 2005 refer five referendum uh, on the uh, constitutional treaty of the European Union, it was very visible, already very visible, that there's a new cleavage which transcends uh, traditional parties like the Socialist Party and uh, the Republicans, which was called UMP at the time. And it was already visible in the social structure that this cleavage might become operational one day in French politics. Now, 2017 was important because there were two main actors, Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron, so the two front runners who were interested in strengthening this new cleavage. Marine Le Pen argued that we nationals are up against the globalist. Emmanuel Macron said, we, the progressives, are against the populists and the nationalists. 
The analysis is correct in both cases. The narrative is different, but they are talking about the same cleavage. The narrative, the framework is different, once again, but the analysis is correct. They are both interested in strengthening this new cleavage. That's the reason why uh, the government and Emmanuel Macron likes to treat Marine Le Pen as, uh, how it's, it's called in France, the uh, le meilleur opponent, opponent uh, the, the best opponent to, to the government, and Marine Le Pen is doing the same thing. This is very important because it's the biggest structural question of this electoral cycle in France. Um, the program of Emmanuel Macron, therefore, is problematic from this electoral point of view, because many of the electors didn't vote for the program technically, yet we can say that with 66% of the vote, it's, it's kind of a huge legitimacy. Uh, I think only Jacques Chirac won bigger in 2002. He got 82% of the vote, and I can assure you that those socialists didn't vote for Jacques Chirac. They voted against Jean-Marie Le Pen in 2002. Um, this structural phenomenon explains why Emmanuel Macron was so rapidly losing electors, first workers, then uh, pensioners, and then um, um, young people. Uh, so these are the three main groups that he lost during the first year in office. Uh, the second reason, uh, beyond the structural region, reasons, uh, is what you refer to as hubris. I very much agree with uh, this phenomenon. It uh, <laughs> raised its ugly head. Uh, I, I think, I wouldn't say that it raised its ugly head for the first time this summer, but I would say that this summer was decisive. And this summer, when I say this summer, I mean the Benalla affair. Uh, you remember this security chief of Emmanuel Macron who uh, went into a fight on the 1st of May uh, this year and then the Elysee for some reason that remains obscure until this day, uh, decided to defend this young man instead of firing this young man for uh, his acts. Uh, and Macron said something like, uh, you want to come after me, then come after me. Uh, so he was like falling in love with the position of uh, the president of France. I think it's a very comprehensive psychological thing because the Elysee famously isolates. Um, I just listened to uh, a colleague, an analyst, uh, Alain Duhamel, who uh, reported from the Elysee, who knew many former presidents and who still um, uh, talks regularly to Elysee staff and he explained that these people work 20 hours a day, <laughs> they really don't have a life uh, besides the Elysee and it's not very surprising that they burn out after two years. So the Elysee is a, uh, is a killer thing. Uh, I, I tend to believe it even if uh, the 20 hours seems to be a little excessive, but uh, it should be really uh, tiring and isolating. Um, so yes, hubris was a part of it and the catastrophic handling of the Benalla affair, uh, which goes on still today. He's been arrested, He'd been arrested uh, last night because, because uh, he, he kind of um, infringed upon the conditions of his bond or something yeah. like that, so he was arrested. Um, but politically speaking, it was a tragedy. Uh, you know, when you have a collaborator who commits crimes or who is suspected of committing crimes, the best thing you can do is you fire the person and you also fire the person who didn't fire him at the first place. This is the classic, uh, classical political handling of these issues. He didn't do that. Um, my explanation is that his staff is young, inexperienced in politics. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine a Jacques Chirac, a Pompidou, a François Mitterrand, who were wolves and foxes uh, and lions at the same time in politics, not to do what you have to do uh, in these cases. Uh, so for the reasons I would enumerate these two things. Uh, for the strategic situation, and I'm not going to explain the movement because Elisabeth Moutet um, did very well explain the reasons behind the movement, I would like to draw your attention to the strategic situation of this political cycle. In 
2017, as I mentioned, Macron won 66%, roughly 66% of the vote in the second round, and he got 24% in the first round. Now, if presidential elections were held this Sunday, which is a classical uh, opinion poll question, in the first round he would get 30% of the vote, which is six points higher than the 24% that he got two years ago. Uh, Marine Le Pen uh, would uh, get 27, so she would come in second. Uh, and then Mélenchon uh, from the France Insoumise and Wauquiez from the Republicans would come in distant third and fourth with 12 and 8 percent. Of course, uh, this Sunday poll is not a this Sunday election, and you know, in Hungary we have this uh, very important saying that you have to win elections and not opinion polls. Uh, but if you want to draw the attention to the strategic situation, I think these numbers are very interesting. And also, this Sunday, Macron would win the second round with 56% uh, of the vote, which is 10 points lower than the 2017 result, but still, it would be uh, a very nice uh, electoral victory. Uh, let me remind you that François Hollande uh, won with 52% uh, or something like that. It would be a very clear electoral victory this Sunday. Um, so, some other opinion poll. I wouldn't say results, but numbers. Um, just last week, for the first time, in the history of this movement, the majority of the French said that they want the Yellow West to stop manifesting, which is uh, a sign that the public opinion is shifting. Uh, there is some change in the winds somewhere. And also, uh, since this great debate, this national consultation started in the middle of January, uh, the popularity of the president and the prime minister has been slowly but steadily rising uh, for several institutes. You know, we say one institute and one poll is, you know, just a sign, but it has been a tendency. And for some electoral polls, uh, the 26th of May, European parliamentary elections, en marche, is still leading <coughs> the competition of French parties with 24%. Uh, the national rally comes in second with 20. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this strategic situ situation is very advantageous to Macron and it's very advantageous to Le Pen. So the strategic situation that brought Macron to the presidency in 27 is still visible uh, in these poll numbers as uh, Mélenchon and Vauquy and their parties come again as distinct third and fourth with 10 and 7.5%. Um, so what I can tell you is that when Macron didn't handle the beginning of the movement well, because for a political movement, he tried to give policy answers instead of giving a political answer, changing prime minister, changing a government, doing something political. Uh, now, it seems that his um, strategy of playing for time pays off. Uh, so yes, uh, I also think that eventually, uh, the movement is going to wear off, uh, the public mood, the public opinion is going to shift. Uh, and at the end of the day, Macron will be able to say that the political situation is status quo. Uh, which is not a win for him. Still not a win for him, but the political situation is going to be status quo because if he's competent enough, if he is uh, tricky enough, he will be able to say that he regained enough popularity to do something to govern, to actually govern. Uh, and his main problem at this moment is that for the last four months, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but he hasn't been governing. He has been reacting. Uh, he hasn't been proposing, he has been following. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, great debate that uh, the government organizes at this moment is a great possibility for the government to work uh, in the background. I'm sure that they are preparing things. I'm sure that the political program of the government is not formulated based on debates. I think 
posters work in the background because that's how modern politics is done. It's a very nice communication um, uh, scoop that they are doing, but really, modern politics is based on uh, opinion polls. Uh, now, if the strategic situation is so advantageous for Emmanuel Macron, what are the reasons for him to be uh, anxious? There are several reasons for him to be uh, anxious. Uh, first of all, macroeconomic numbers are not that tragic for France. For instance, uh, just a few weeks ago came out a new uh, unemployment data which said that finally unemployment uh, shifted below 9%. Very nice. But he just threw out 10 billions of euros a few uh, months ago in reaction to this yellowist movement, which is going to push uh, French deficit most probably uh, through the 3% threshold, which is the European limit. So that's a problem. Uh, also, French public debt has been steadily rising since the crisis. Uh, so while Germany managed to grow out the debt with uh, very um, consciously crafted budgets, uh, France uh, hasn't been able to do so. Uh, I'm not sure if it's for lack of ambition or for uh, lack of competency. It's a secondary question. The French public debt is very close to the 100% of the GDP which is far from the Italian case, which is far from the Greek case, but uh, if economist colleagues are right, and in 2019 or 20 or 21 there comes a recession, France will not be in an advantageous situation to uh, pump money to the economy. Second, they will not be able, and from a European point of view, this is very important. Macron will not be able to tell the German to give money to our common Eurozone plans. Uh, you cannot be sure what we are going to do with it. Sometimes we, we have the streets and then we have to throw 10 billions out of the window. Uh, I'm being cynical here, but that's, I'm sure that some people in Germany see it like that. Uh, and secondly, uh, we are in a much more serious economic situation than Germany uh, and the crisis is looming on the horizon uh, and the political mandate and the future, the political future of Emmanuel Macron uh, is very much dependent on the economy, purchasing power, uh, the social situation of the peripheral of France, unemployment which is yes structural it is not necessarily an unemployment problem that is dependent on uh, conjuncture. So, uh, the most important danger for Emmanuel Macron is that he might very well be falling to the Sarkozy trap. Nicolas Sarkozy launched his political mandate with very ambitious reforms, uh, decreasing uh, the tax burden of his electorate, and there came the Great Recession and he had to revert back, he had to uh, change policy, he had to change discourse, and ultimately he wasn't able to campaign on his economic results, uh, let alone on his economic program, because he kind of um, messed up with his base already in 2008 when he talked about the moralization of capitalism, talking to a liberal political basis. Uh, so I think the most important danger domestically for Emmanuel Macron is the economy. Uh, and it's a danger that we talk about uh, very rarely because it's just looming uh, on the horizon. And secondly, from a European standpoint, and um, if you take a look at his campaign, in August, in September, Emmanuel Macron launched a very loud, very conflictual, uh, very combative European campaign clashing with Salvini, clashing with Viktor Orban, clashing with whoever was designated as the Marine Le Pen of Europe. 
because that's the same logic, the same cleavage that he is utilizing, he is trying to utilize at a European level. And let me tell you that these other politicians who are also good tacticians play along because they can also use that cleavage. Uh, but the Yellow West movement changed the nature of the campaign of Emmanuel Macron. He is now forced and bound to pay attention inwardly and domestically, so he cannot uh, play this political game which would you know, build his political power in Europe because he has to restore his legitimacy domestically. And that's a problem for him. If I'd have to analyze his European parliamentary campaign, I would say it's a domestic campaign. This is not the campaign he wanted to do. This is something entirely else. He was forced to do it. Uh, it doesn't mean that he hasn't got a good chance to win this election. But it's not the campaign, it's not the message, it's not the structure that he wanted to build. Uh, and I think it will be important. And it may become even more important if there is this crisis and if he has to handle that crisis. I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, that was a wonderfully clear and lucid analysis of the situation. I certainly um, learned a lot from it and changed perhaps some of my uh, prejudices. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to our third speaker, uh, Ulla Turkelson. Um, if this was an audience of Danes, you would all know Ulla very well. She is the most famous foreign correspondent in Denmark. Um, I first met her back in the 1970s uh, when she... Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I think it was... I don't think this is quite fair, actually. But anyway, um, but Ulla has covered um, Northern Ireland. She's been a correspondent in Moscow, in Kabul. Where she, uh, I'm sorry, not Moscow. In that case, it's the only place in which you haven't been a correspondent. But, and certainly in Kabul, I remember you recommending I go to Kabul, where, there were, where you said there were excellent restaurants. Um, in, in, in Washington, in, in London, in, um, I think there is uh, 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 Warsaw, Berlin, yes, and, but not Moscow, odd. Um, <laughs> um, and, and as I say, um, because of um, the fact she has uh, covered the, the world uh, and all of the major crises of the last uh, 30 or odd years, um, she is ex very well known in, in uh, in Denmark and increase and of course outside it as well and so it's a great pleasure for me to welcome an old friend Ulla Turkelson to discuss the situation in France where she now lives. Thank you very much and it is true we did meet in the late 60s but as I said you can't trust men on age they always lie. Thank you Melissa, thank you John, I'm very happy to be with you here. <laughs> Uh, John's uh, question, I thought, was very interesting. John said, what is happening in France? I would like to expand it and say, what is happening in Europe? Because in your part of the world, in Hungary and also in Poland, which I know well, you always have this sort of thing about people in Western Europe saying, oh, what is happening in Hungary? What is happening in Poland? And they say from their democracy, look what's happening in Western Europe. If you look at Italy, which, which have the Cinque Stelle, which is similar to the uh, Yellow Vest. If you have France, where they are fighting in the street every week and throwing bricks at cars and things. And if you look at the United Kingdom, where Parliament is locked in a completely bizarre, surrealist uh, parliamentary procedure to get this Brexit or not Brexit through, and where the political parties are now showing uh, signs of dissolving, where the Labour Party is uh, being uh, totally tormented by an anti-Semitic debate where people in the Labour Party are being accused of anti-Semitism, uh, and now the Tories are splitting up, there are people going out of the Conservative Party saying they cannot bear the way this Brexit policy is is working or not working. So if you look at the three biggest par biggest countries in Western Europe, Italy, France, and United Kingdom, there's certainly all sorts of reason to worry. Or is there? Because you can also say, who says we are going to have a political life or political system or a line of or political parties that the one we had when John and I were children, which is, of course, 
not a very long time ago, but <clears throat> there you had some parties you could trust, they were set up like that, but then we have reached a point now where people don't trust that setup anymore, when they don't trust that division of labor between the political parties that we've grown up with and had for decades after the Second World War. And they're rebelling against it, they're moving against it, and they're using untraditional methods. And of course, the establishment is scared. It's starting. We don't know if there's a reason to be scared or not. We don't know if this is just a completely natural development after years of a political system, which was the same year in and year out, and now it is changing for all sorts of reasons which have been analyzed at great lengths, you know, the social media where people become famous writing blogs or looking good on a mobile phone <laughs> so they get on telly and say something which might sound much more exciting than what conventional politics and say that's one part of it and then of course immigration which is a tense and created political tension in a lot of European countries including my own Denmark and then you have of course the whole globalization thing which a lot of people have to get used to and which some people like and think is dynamic and exciting and other people say but what about me I can't cope with that globalization. And because of all that, you have a completely different lineup in politics now. And I don't think it's strange. I think it's quite natural it had to come. If it's good for our democracy, I don't know. If it will end in terrible things, you're not in France. There is a huge debate at the moment about anti-Semitism. There is something called Islamo-Gauchism, which is left Islamism sympathy in this movement. You have lots of, there is a huge also anti-Semitic debate at the moment in Britain of all places. Who would have thought that, as Mrs. May said? Who would have thought that I should stand in the British Parliament and condemn anti-Semitism in a major political party. So there are all sorts of <clears throat> undercurrents of nastiness popping up and there might also be a, <coughs> a renewal on its way. We don't know yet. The fact that a lot of people are now involved in politics and saying something with shrill voices and unpleasant uh, methods is something which might be good for democracy. They can't just sit and nod and look at the usual politicians. And if they don't like them, then they go out and say they don't do it. So there is a courage in that, I think, in an engagement. But it is using methods and doing it in ways which we don't like and, of course, we also think that you, the use of street violence and the use of anti-Semitism and all that, of course, that's nasty, but there is a sort of cork taking <coughs> off a bottle and there's a lot of things coming out. What we uh, don't know is how the political establishment, uh, how it will react to that, and also we don't know the balance yet again, uh, between what we call populism, which is a popular, huh, populist, popular word for these new movements, and then the established political parties. But we don't have to wait for very long, because in May there is, as of course you know, the European elections, the election to the European Parliament, and it will be very, very exciting to see uh, how, uh, how it will divide itself, how these parties will do on a European scale vis-a-vis -vis the traditional political parties. And I've worked in Brussels, and I've loved all the places I lived, but the but being a European correspondent in Brussels when I was there, the Maastricht Treaty and all that was very, very boring. I admit that in this closed circle. Don't tell my bosses. But being a European correspondent running around in the corridors of power in Brussels can be very, very boring. Not all bureaucrats are funny, to put it mildly. So, uh, we shall not, I have never thought I would hear myself say that covering a European election, which I will be doing, will be very exciting. But this, of course, will be that we, will, uh, we can see how the balance will be between these new forces that have come out of the bottle and then traditional politics. Europe, uh, uh, the European project, uh, of course, is in a state of shock because of all that. Because the European project is built up on a system that uh, organizes the traditional old-fashioned parties. The European Parliament is more or less organized along those lines. And such is the reactions in Brussels. And everybody is, of course, looking at what is happening in France, what is happening in Italy, what is happening in the United Kingdom, and saying, what do we do? How do we react? There is a silly joke, but it's a good one, so I'll repeat it. May I? So. <laughs> that is the, uh, the, the old Xu Enlai. You remember him, the Chinese leader. Oh, how do we pronounce him? 
Xu Enlai, Xu Enlai. He was asked once, many, many years ago, what did he think about the French Revolution in 1789? And then he said, oh, it's far too early to say. <laughs> it's quite funny, isn't it? Uh, to return to the original subject, uh, which is that of, uh, of uh, Macron, uh, then uh, I agree with what you said, and that you cannot say that uh, it is not a social revolution, because that people make trouble in the street is not necessarily a social revolution. There are more French people that do not make trouble in the streets than those who do make trouble in the streets. But uh, it is still uh, something that has set a new agenda, and there's still something uh, that shows that the influence of the Italians uh, were, they are first movers in this, of course. The first mover in all this was Berlusconi. He broke the political systems in 1990, and now we have a government in Italy, which is the Cinque Stelle and the Liga, and they are the ones that are most like the, uh, the Yellow Vests. But uh, the thing is, how will he cope with it? How will Macron cope with it? My uh, feeling is that uh, he will try to sit it out. He will, uh, he will <coughs> s stop uh, uh, doing the economic reforms that he said were terribly, terribly important to, uh, to uh, improve the French economy. He won't, he will drop them. He will be much more gentle in his economic policy, not as tough as he was in the beginning. And then, of course, he will probably, in a sinister way, hope that the violence increases. Because if the violent fringe that is in that movement, if they become more and more violent, more and more nasty, a lot of the nice people, the nice provincial couple, who live in a small farm, who can't cope, you know, the, un the recently unemployed middle-class families who can't cope and who joined the movement in the beginning. Of course, they don't want to go if it, it becomes anti-Semitic and harsh in its vocabulary and also uh, if uh, there is too much violence. Then they will withdraw and there will be fewer and fewer uh, demonstrator. So he might sit it out, might try to sit it out and hope that the people will withdraw from the movement because they will not like that violence, which is always there. This is also when you have a street demonstration, there will all be some not to throw bricks. Uh, and then, of course, he's having this dialogue, he is, which I think is also a different way of having politics. He's going, having been elected, you would have thought he sort of just went on <laughs> governing, but he can't do that because of this uh, rebellion. Uh, so now he's going out having all these meetings with mayors. And sometimes I've heard he speak six hours in a row. I promise I won't be doing Six hours is a long time to listen to the same person. It's almost sort of Fidel Castro length he spoke for. <laughs> 10 hours, I think. But he goes round and he talks to all these mayors all over France and all these different people. And then, of course, he has the dialogue, which, of course, he should have had a long time ago. If he hasn't got that feel for feeling what people think, then he should done, have done that uh, dialogue a long time ago. But now he has it. And with these elements, postponing the unpleasant uh, economic uh, measures, uh, hoping the violence squeezes the nice people out of the, uh, the, the Yellow West movement, and then listen to what they actually say. With that sort of triangle, uh, he might actually uh, come well out of this. This is a possibility. Let's be optimistic. But Europe is in trouble in the way that uh, it is not as it used to be. And I think like Xu and Lai, that's why I quoted him, so me and Xu and Lai, we agree on that one. Uh, it, is, it is too early to say whether this very exciting, it's a very exciting time to be a journalist, whether this very exciting and very so tense period we are in now, whether that is the beginning of something different, maybe better, or whether it is something which can lead to a nasty development. We don't know that yet. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Ola. Uh, we've had three uh, um, wonderful uh, analyses and speeches. Um, I'm going to extend the discussion somewhat because we started a little late. So we have another uh, sort of something like 20 minutes, 25 minutes perhaps. Um, perhaps. Um, I can th throw open questions to the f from the floor. Would anyone like to ask the first? Mark. Uh, well, look, thank you. Thank you very much for three fantastic uh, presentations. And I, I have learned a lot more than I knew uh, at the beginning of, the, of this evening. Um, uh, but I'm still, I must say, um, a little bit um, unclear um, uh, to, to what extent we can talk of the Gilets Jaunes as a, as a coherent uh, 
organization, not not organization, but movement, um, with uh, common goals. Now, Anne, you, you were talking about, for example, a, a sort of tax the rich agenda uh, as being sort of reasonably common to it. But is there anything more you can say about uh, what their agenda is? For example, I mean, the the, uh, the impetus to a lot of these demonstrations was the eco-tax. I mean, you know, can one talk about a sort of a, a scepticism about... Um, uh, um, you know, climate change and so forth. Um, so I'd be interested uh, just on that question of coherence. And secondly, I think you mentioned there was a possibility of them running candidates in the European elections. Uh, I'd just be interested if you, you can say anything more about that. I think that's that's really a good question because there's very little that they agree on. The, the eco-tax um, was seen as having always people, the, the burden of paying for things that they have no control over, uh, put squarely on the people who can least afford it. Uh, the, um, and that the eco-tax uh, was, was, was killed uh, by Macron uh, before Christmas, and we're, we're now in mid-February, so it's, it's, it's way beyond that. Uh, it's also interesting that because the movement has morphed so much, there have been studies about how things go. Uh, there's a kind of, uh, you know, conspiracy theorists abound in the yellow jackets that you can talk to. The yellow jackets, and we have to take the figures with a massive heap of salt, are, uh, at the height of the movement were fewer than 100,000 people in the entire country. Uh, demonstrators in the streets in recent uh, weeks have been, you know, all together in all cities in France under 20,000. So we're not talking about a mass movement, but we are talking about uh, the few things that you can sort of put together is there's always a tendency in France uh, uh, to uh, condemn the rich. Uh, the, uh, the, the France is a country that has both a long storied history of Catholicism and of Marxism. And if you add the two together, you have a detestation of finance that becomes almost magical thinking and, and which makes it very difficult for people to say, uh, Capitalism is actually uh, creating more riches for everyone. Um, and there's also the, the whole history of the 1% having you know, vast amounts of the world wealth. Uh, some of the figures that circulated a couple of weeks ago were completely false, an idea that the, um, uh, 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 I think uh, that half, 1%, half of 1% owned about half the riches in the world, and it's completely false. But the fact that you know, all of this has been sort of buoyed by, the, uh, by social media, where you can circulate any kind of attractive lie, and, and this will get traction before people work at decoding it and explaining, no, debunking it, this is not true, it doesn't work. So what do they want? They want taxes on the rich. They cannot explain who the rich are and what this is going to end into, even from Macron, is taxing uh, the long-suffering affluent middle class. Uh, I'll give you examples. Um, the wealth tax in France was, was uh, created by Mitterrand, and it's now seen as a sort of sacred uh, uh, um, uh, part of the French tax system that any president trying to get away with uh, will get beaten in the polls. The one who first tried was Sarkozy. Uh, he tried to say that, uh, you know, the it's not just the amount of the wealth tax, it's the fact that lots of people in France uh, could not face the inquisitiveness of it and left France. Uh, you had people who had many invested in their companies, but many invested in things that they could not, that were not liquid. There's a, a ridiculous example of farmers in the Ile de Ré, which is uh, a, a small strip of island uh, off the coast of Brittany, which is very expensive in summer because it's a nice place to go and spend your holidays. It's, un, it's very chic and un, unblingy, and, um, and it's, it's, very, it's very nice, but that means that people who farm potatoes there um, own, in theory, uh, land worth several million euros, except that they're still the same fields of potatoes bringing in a, a pittance uh, than the, they, they were 30 years ago. And suddenly they found themselves subjected to the wealth tax. Um, we've had a constant immigration of, of, of wealthy individuals in France. They didn't like paying the tax. Worse than that, they didn't like the inquisitiveness. And the inquisitiveness of France has always been uh, a, a, a constant in French history where people like sort of peeking into uh, uh, others' uh, possessions. They like the inventories of the fortune or just the possessions of various politicians. Uh, all sorts of rules of transparency have been established. And what they've done is, is literally encourage jealousy more than anything else. So on the one hand, the right wants to <coughs> do away with this because they feel that it's counterproductive in terms of having an economy in which 
<coughs> succeeding is seen as, as a good thing. And on the other, you've got uh, the more there's protests and the more you've got this, this issue which becomes complete poison. Sarkozy tried to do away with the wealth tax, the ISF, impôt de solidarité sur la fortune, which in itself is an interesting thing. Uh, have solidarity with your fortune. The whole thing is very ideological. It is not called a wealth tax. And instead of, uh, he created a very complicated technocratic system in which uh, people could not pay out, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, more than, than it, it could never be more than 50% of what they owned. Uh, it didn't really work out, and he was condemned roundly for having this complicated system that nobody understood. Uh, the uh, Macron decided that the tax on, on uh, finance, uh, financial holdings would disappear because uh, uh, the, the economy needed investment. People had left France who were needed to create companies and to buy capital, you know, to bring capital to companies. But there would still be a wealth tax um, based on people's holding in property. Um, and the result is that nobody has dared do it. They've suffered the, the, the consequences. And right now, I cannot see, I, I see more taxes. There have now, uh, until now in France, you, the French inheritance tax are, is huge if you're, if you're not Direct descendants inheritance tax is 60%, for instance, um, and the uh, I see this is never going to stop. But I can uh, you used to one of the things that was exempt from it if you if you own your own house or flat uh, that uh, the the um, the capital gains from when you bought it to when you sold it that was not taxable. It there's now talk of making it taxable, and Macron said, but of course we will only tax the rich, which means the inhabitants of those cities that have been so conveniently pointed out by Christophe Guilloui, the geographer, as being with it. So he takes on one hand, he puts on the other, which means the resentment in, in, in the country has, will go on in the same old rut. It's not a political program. It's a condition for keeping the debate fruitlessly in exactly the same rut as before. Um, the reforms of flexibility in the labor market, like uh, the Hartz reforms in Germany, or like the portability in Denmark, that Ulla probably knows more than I do in terms of social uh, welfare, so that you can leave a job, be fired, find, you know, be, be socially protected, etc. All of this is now being uh, uh, criticized roundly on the right and on the left, who f feel that they can always bank on people feeling that whatever reform happens, it's going to be worse. Um, so I, I can see explosions in the future. That was, that was, that, that was your question in terms of whether there is a... a sorry? Um, they will run probably a list, and polls right now give 8% to a list like that. And of course, uh, a list of the Gilets Jaunes is going to be favored by Macron because it splits the National Front's vote. The, the National Front will pull everything they can, and uh, it will, but they will still sort of, Macron can say, look, you have to support me because I win against Marine. And it's just because there have been there's there's, there's more on offer uh, on on the right, and therefore the right is which was stronger came out stronger after uh, Macron's election than the old left, which doesn't exist anymore. That right is split enough so that Macron can sort of look at 2022 and his re-election in 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 a good way. This is, to be honest, I mean I'm very pessimistic because this is the politics of. Uh, sourness and destruction. None of this is has got anything with idealism. None of the. It's all political calculation. It's all. Uh, it's and it's not even the kind of calculation in which you think what you're going to achieve is more. How am I going to benefit from the others making mistakes? Uh, and it makes for a completely. Uh, disgruntled state of public opinion in which anything can happen, which is why I do not see an end. Thank you. Um, just one, just one little sentence uh, to uh, the question. Um, when it comes to the Gilets jaunes, uh, I think one of the major characteristics of this movement is the lack of coherence. Uh, there is also one more thing, let's tax, tax the, the rich, that's true, but they also say they want a bouclier fiscal again uh, for themselves. Bouclier fiscal for? For themselves, because they are too taxed. So there are. Oh, that's a different thing. That's, that's yes. another. Th yes. um, I don't have the English word on at the uh, end of my tongue. Yeah, uh, you know this. The the limit of the taxes uh, that are due, which was, yeah, a tax cap or something like that. Uh, it was at 50% uh, during the Sarkozy era. Now they want something. 
Okay. Uh, and the uh, social levies are incredibly punitive, and the attitude, the French tax man is actually a reasonable person, except when it's for social leave levies. And in that case, there was the IRS in America. Hmm. I mean, they can kill a company with that. And they also want uh, a new type of referendum in the constitution, uh, a new type of referendum which can be launched by the people. Uh, in the current constitution, it, it is not possible because even if uh, the, the referendum is launched by the people, parliament still has control over the organization of uh, the, the election. And they, if they don't want it, it's not going to be organized. It's, uh, exactly. It's I, I, if, if, uh, am I on? No. <laughs> No, no, I, 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 just one more little sentence, that. that in this movement, uh, the number of protesters is less important than the result of opinion polls. So that's why I was coming with opinion poll numbers, because that's what people are watching. 100,000 people on the streets, it not, it's not much. Uh, in 2013, uh, there were millions of people on the streets, and uh, the marriage equality law was still adopted uh, the government didn't really care. The reason why the government cares now is because opinion polls favor the gilets jaunes. No, I just wanted to say because I, I'm sort of playing the optimist. I'm the optimist in this panel. John is the neutral uh, lawyer. But uh, um, this debate, for example, about referenda, like in Switzerland, uh, when you have a movement like that, it's ob I, I mean, I also think it's horrible they're burning people's cars and throwing bricks at each other. And all this, I mean, you could say all the nasty things about them that you can uh, imagine. But uh, there's also a pressure in it. I mean, they are highlighting all these problems you described so vividly in in your uh, first presentation. And if it results in a more uh, direct, more uh, sensible, sensitive democracy, then this uh, very haughty system that you have in France with those terrible people from Linac, who these uh, elite schools who decide everything, uh, then it might be uh, some good side effects of it. For example, this debate about referenda. Anyway, I'm just trying to be the optimist, but I think it's exciting what you... Thank you very much indeed. Um, N next question. Well, I have a, a point which I want to uh, ask the three uh, panelists to consider. It's the sep this year is the 60th anniversary of the publication of The Rise of the Meritocracy, a book which actually invented the word meritocracy and defined it as IQ plus, plus effort equals merit. And at the end of that book, which is a satire, he wasn't actually advocating meritocracy as now considered to be a good thing, but in the book it's not. It's a, uh, it's a lot, it's, he's very critical of the concept. But at the end of the book, um, which is, as I say, a satire, he describes a situation, it's Michael Young, who wrote the Labour Party's manifesto in 1945 and became a great figure in English intellectual life. Michael Young describes uh, how rebellions are breaking out in different parts of Britain, which people, previously people have assumed could not happen since all the clever people had been promoted through schools and universities into the top positions, and very similar to the system you described in, in France. And I wonder, I mean, I'm struck by the foresight and predictive power of this book. Um, and, and the fact that it's not just, what it's describing is not just happening in, in, um, in France, it's happening in Italy, where the kind of uh, disorganized character of the response for a long time is very similar to what happens in the rise of the meritocracy. So are we seeing, is, is what we are seeing, among other things, um, the fact that the meritocracy has, as a system has passed its peak and is now beginning to encounter difficulties and rebellions which it doesn't really know how to cope with precisely because they bypass its channels of um, uh, rule and its channels of advancement. Um, who will answer? <coughs> Well, the interesting thing is that uh, it's, we discuss it on a theoretical level in a lot of countries, but in Italy, they are in power. I mean, and in, in Italy is a very strange country, but they're sort of first movers, political first movers. 
<laughs> Mussolini was the first fascist, fascist dictator in Europe. He was before everybody else. Uh, and Berlusconi was the first mover. We can say we hate it. We can find him disgusting, his manner of, of flaunting his wealth and having belly dancers and, uh, and Brussels and all that sort of stuff. Not a very moral man, but then the Italians didn't care. Like they don't care about Trump and his sort of excessive uh, past in, in that particular field. But uh, they are there and they react to something. And then in, in, in Italy, it's not theory anymore. They are actually in the government, in a big, important founding member of the European Union. And uh, we have to deal with, and I think that it is... Uh, well, I'm a journalist, so I don't have opinions, but I, uh, as a journalist, you describe... <laughs> No, I describe these things. I describe, I mean, I don't say, aren't they horrible? I describe why they are there, and they are there, and, and I think democracies have to deal with them. It's the same as the reaction to Donald Trump in America. Everybody shouted and screamed and said, this was horrible. And I want to quote Ezio Mauro, who is uh, the editor of the uh, Republica, now a leader writer, who said, uh, ignorance is the only guarantee for innocence, which is, if you think about it, it's quite interesting. So if somebody is really ignorant, then you vote for him. That sort of <laughs> starts. But, but this is the arrogant interpretation. But you can also say it's not arrogance. It's also you vote for somebody who is not tainted by the politics that you're fed up with. And this is where we have to be very careful, I think, with being too uh, uh, arrogant against these movements. Um, I, I, I think there used to be a compact that made meritocracy something that people agreed to because they felt that even if they themselves could not attain the heights that meritocrats did, that children would have a fair shot at it. And the destruction of the education system in most of our nations has killed the whole idea uh, that you have a system in which people can go and, and, and succeed. And in America, the discrepancy between the, the, the richest, you know, what basically sort of changed the system in the 80s uh, was something that uh, uh, killed the idea that this was a country in which the American dream could be achieved. And in France, and I remember very well in my childhood, the, the, the time of when those technocrats were known as les serviteurs de l'État, the servants of the state, they were people who did not go and leave the, uh, the civil service to go and work for private companies for a, a lot of gain. They were people who were humble and they were arrogant in what they were doing, but they did not see themselves as part of the caste apart. And I think there is something which you know, possibly will not happen again, but that's, that's one part of that, you know, the respect for people who were dedicating their lives to doing something for the state, that's fairly disappeared. And again, the education system has lived in the past 40, 50 years on the complete dream uh, that you can educate uh, everyone the same way, and because you can educate everyone the same way, basically the ones who manage to do well are the ones whose parents are capable, have books at home and who can pay for private schools for the others. So we have play, and the French system was supposed to be uh, immune to this. The people who send the best students, people like Macron, etc., to their great government schools are public high schools, they, they are state, but at the same time, uh, uh, no, not, not everybody gets into these. And, and the, if you go to lycées in the banlieues and, and the provinces, they will not send you to those schools. And if you go to university in France and you don't know that there are one or two feeder institutions, again, you will not get there. So we have played false uh, our, our, uh, 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 our children, and we, we've sort of destroyed the, the political system because of that. And what something that absolutely horrifies me, and I'm speaking to you as you know, Hungarians and Eastern Europeans, when I started traveling throughout Eastern Europe immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall, because I found you know, this extraordinary. I kept on meeting young people who helped me, translated for me, etc., and who were the product of the uh, education system of places like Lithuania, Poland, uh, Russia, etc. And their education was fantastic. Uh, they spoke good French, they uh, knew mathematics, they uh, could quote poetry in their language and in mine. They were cultured. And I am told and I'm told by Russian friends, I'm told, I was told the last time I was here by Hungarian friends that the education system itself is now uh, being uh, uh, changed to, to uh, uh, have those reforms that have proven so disastrous 
for the Western world. I do not know why this is happening, and I think that's the one thing that we should push the most is to recreate at every level uh, a school of excellence, and then that's the only way out. But I don't know who's going to sort of take those decisions. Uh, Esther, can I just uh, uh, would you like to come in on this again? Um, and I'd like to raise a slightly different problem, but I think the two things are very much linked to each other. Um, there is this concept, this notion that we've been debating in the Western Hemisphere for years now, it's liberal democracy. Um, and I think what we see today in the Western world, in France, in the United States, perhaps in Hungary, Italy and uh, other countries, the UK, uh, is a democratic theoretical problem that is becoming a practical question now. Uh, it means that we very consciously, for historical reasons, vetted liberalism and democracy together into a very balanced system. Uh, but there are electors and thus political powers who now claim that uh, liberal democracy became too liberal in a sense that liberalism is trying to put constraints on power, on democratic decision making, uh, which is, I, I think is very timely and this is the place and the time to quote Tocqueville who said that uh, uh, the tyranny of the majority is something to fear and that uh, liberal democracy became too focused on this liberal aspect of constraining power. And now, uh, perhaps what we see in these movements, the flyover country, the, the peripheral France, and all those people who say, okay, if this is a democracy, even if it's a liberal democracy, let's make it a democracy. We want something else, and we contest some of these const constraints. Uh, it's a very, um, we might even admit it's frightening because it hasn't been the status quo for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, I don't know how many years, but I think this is a really a question, a problem, what we are scraping here that goes into the heart of the theory of liberal democracy. Uh, so we could debate it uh, for hours and days, even without mentioning concrete politicians and political movements. Thank you, I, I completely agree with that. And I'd say that I think that probably we will try to arrange soon a, a, a debate which will clarify the question. On the one hand, one side says the, the current politics of Europe and other parts of the world, Australia, is, is one in which populism is threatening liberal democracy. The other point of view says not at all. Populism is democracy responding to oligarchic government disguised, uh, exercised through liberal institutions. And I think this is a very important debate. And so far, it's been not entirely, but much more one-sided uh, than it has been, partly because, of course, the liberal De democracy side of the argument generally runs a lot of the institutions, particularly the media and publishing and other things. There's been something I think people in this room would be familiar with, a breakthrough with books like, for example, Yoram Hazani's book on the virtue of nationalism and other things. But again, these are, these are, these are arguments and debates which are only beginning to break through uh, the carapace. Now, um, I, I see one, uh, someone at the back Anybody, we, we ha this will have to be the last question. Or the, um, the last two questions, the gentleman there, the gentleman there, and, and, um, and we'll try to wrap it up. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Benoit from France. And uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do you think, because I, I don't get to talk to journalists very often, so I wanted to have your opinion. Uh, what do you think of the influence of the media uh, in this uh, Yellow Vest movement? Do you think it has a strong influence? And also, I wanted to know if you see yourselves as independent, uh, because as, as we know in France, most of the newspapers are owned by private companies, so they, are, uh, they don't live from the, the money that they get when they sell newspapers. So uh, sometimes we see this as a way to buy influence with uh, the newspaper. So I wanted to have your opinion about this. You, you mentioned the uh, Yellow Vest Party. Um, what do you think of the influence of Bernard Tapie, for instance, who is trying to uh, organize a Yellow Vest Party, but you said that it might divide the votes. So I wanted to have your opinion about this. And uh, yeah, what is the, 
the, the influence in general in this movement. Thank you. I am Peter Molnar, and I would like to ask whether you would agree that constraint on power, on the power of any human being, provided that we humans are all potential monsters, and if we have unlimited power, the monster can easily come out. So would you agree that that's not only a liberal value, but also, say, a conservative value, just, I finish with this example. One example comes to mind. In Hungary, the first demand of the 12th, in the 12 points of the revolutionaries in 1848 is the abolishment of censorship, freedom of the press. Freedom of the press as unabridged as possible is of course one of the most important constraints on power. And so that was, and that is a shining part of the Hungarian tradition, commitment to freedom, and it happens to be a wish to constrain power. Whoever is that power, the king or the English revolutionaries who reintroduced censorship after they P got Pisa, the power. We, we, yeah, that's we, it. So, 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 so it's, it's not just a liberal value. I think it's we, we are really going on the wrong road okay. if we think it's just a liberal value. No, no, thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, the question about uh, the uh, media. In the beginning, it was very difficult to cover because uh, they were beating up journalists and pushing journalists away, and uh, it was difficult to talk to people. I mean, the militants, uh, the the violent people, uh, uh, did a very bad job for the movement because they 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 were uh, uh, being very aggressive against journalists. Uh, but then they started sort of having a pontu uh, uh, spokespersons who then sort of went up and started talking to the media. And they're now quite frequent guests on on uh, on, te on live television shows like BFM TV and so on in France. So they've sort of moved in. But then the interesting thing is then if there's a sort of a spokesperson who becomes too established, uh, there was a nice man sort of wearing nice glasses and a suit who was sort of speaking very, uh, sort of one understood what he said. And then... Uh, some of the people in the movement get angry with him because they think he's becoming too bourgeois and too much a part of the system. So then he gets in. So it's a very, very uh, complicated picture. I didn't quite catch the second uh, question. I'm sure you will. Uh, I, I think that the second question is a philosophical question for which we need uh, another conference, and I think it's a really important thing. I'm not sure that the, and you, you are Hungarian, and I don't know, but I'm not entirely sure that the point about the freedom of the press was entirely respected between 1948 and 19, uh, uh, 1989, but you tell me. Um, but uh, on, on the question of my, my uh, compatriot français, um, the People who own the press now own newspapers and television channels not to make money, but as a, an array of vanity projects, more or less selflessly. Um, and uh, it's very rare, contrary to general impression, that uh, uh, proprietors actually tell writers what to write and, and broadcasters what to say. Uh, I will, I hope you don't talk back to my bosses at the Telegraph, but basically we know perfectly well that right now the Telegraph is covering Brexit because our owners are 140% pro-Brexit. And it's the first time that this has happened to me in 30 years of writing for English newspapers, and I'm a bit surprised on this one. The, there is a sort of uh, sense of distance that has been a bit lost by my own newspaper, but that's really very specific on one in, issue. But most of the time, I've never in my life, and I worked for left-wing newspapers, I've worked for right-wing newspapers, and, and it's rather rare uh, that um, actually you, you've been told to do anything. And I don't, especially in the case of the Yellow Jackets, we don't know that the proprietors have any kind of opinion on this because the movement, as, as uh, Esther says so well, is completely uh, uh, inchoate and, and unstructured with, with components from various aspects of society. So I, 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 don't, think, um, I don't think that works so much. I know, I know that it's always easy to say uh, uh, 
and, and certainly many of the yellow jackets and the one who were the most vocal were saying, you know, your bosses want to do this, want to achieve that, but that wasn't true. Even if you take uh, that channel that uh, Ula quoted, BFM TV, which is the most successful 24-hour cable relentless news station, uh, their reporters were trying as, as best they could to sort of cover the news and show uh, pictures that people would stay in front of their screens uh, looking at for a bit more. So that was more clickbait or, or you know, uh, eyeball bait more than anything else. I don't think it was political. Well, I'm not from, from the French media. I don't really have uh, a boss and the proprietor, so I'm going to skip the first question, I think. I'm, it's legitimate. For the second question, I just would like to say uh, and raise an issue for the long debate uh, about democracy. Uh, that in 1222, when uh, the Hungarian king issued uh, its own version of the Magna Carta Libertatum, which was very close to the uh, English version, uh, the main idea was constraining power. So I think the question is not whether constraining power or not, it's rather how and how much. So. And, and of course, if you empower uh, institutions to constrain power, they then may very well uh, evolve into, in, into institutions which exercise power through the technical restraints. Um, I think we've had a fantastically entertaining but also insightful uh, and very expert panel. I very much enjoyed it from this side of the table. I'm sure you have from yours. I'd like you to join me in thanking them very warmly indeed. Thank you. Thank you.